said on an ancestor class. So for example, we have a method, or we have a class called pizza in our example. And there's a get cost and get bake time. So the question is, what if the cost of a pizza, and let's say we have a new kind of pizza, stuffed crust pizza, so we inherit from that. So we have pizza as the superclass, and the subclass is stuffed crust pizza. We can do that because stuffed crust pizza is a, uh, is a pizza. Just a different kind of pizza. It's a specialized version of a pizza. So, let's say the rule for determining the price of a stuffed crust pizza is it's the price of the regular pizza plus three dollars. So, a, if a large costs ten, a stuffed large stuffed crust costs thirteen. If a small costs six, a large stuffed crust costs nine. Okay. So essentially, what we want to do is we're going to inherit this. We're going to create there's a get cost method on the pizza already that goes through some calculations based on a topping and returns a cost. Really what we want to do, now we could do one of two things. We could copy that method in there, but the problem with that is what if the, base for, the baseline uh, increases? Uh, the cost of a regular large pizza goes up, would want to bump up the stuffed crust as well. So really what we want to do is when we call get cost, we create a get cost method here. When we call that method, we're going to get the logic that's here. Well, really what we want to do is we want to run this logic and take the result and then do something with it. So like maybe add $3 in this particular case. You can do that by calling the superclasses version of the method in this manner. All right? So I could say double cost equals super get cost. That would call the get cost method on the super class. So it would call the regular pizza's get cost method and store the result in store the result in a variable. I could then say, well, the cost of a stuffed crust pizza is $3 more, and then return cost. So that's how you could handle it. Again, with inheritance, you make a more specialized version of the player, uh, of, the, uh, of the class. I'm thinking ahead of the blackjack game. Um, you make a, a specialized version of the class. So a stuffed crust pizza is a kind of pizza. And it has everything a pizza has, but it has some of its own rules. You know, it might take it longer to bake, and it might cost more. So if you had to go in and, and do a method that used the super classes calculation as a baseline and then altered it, you'd do it in this way. All right? By using the super. We'll see, uh, those of you that are in Java class, which I, don't know, I think there's a couple of you, we'll see this when we do, uh, we'll see a similar thing with constructors, all right, um, where, where we can chain constructors together this way, all right? Okay, now onward and upward. What I want to do today is I want to, uh, I mentioned I want to go through the um, dealing of cards. All right. So I want to show you the code that deals cards. That's all that I wanted to do. So we'll spend some time talking about that. And then we'll talk about, well, what would you need to do to take it to the next step? I think this will be useful in doing your design and, and so on. So let me run the app first. Oh, look, it's already running. All right, I have, and let me 
me reposition. Uh, pardon me? Let me at least reposition my taskbar, make it smaller, and move it off to the side. Well, we'll see this example, and we'll see what we're going to go over. Absolutely. Um, all right, gives us a little more room. All right. If I hit hit, deals me a card. Hit deals me another card, another card, another card, another card. And that's scrollable. All right, so it, it's not, how do I want to say this? All it's doing is it's going in, it's dealing cards one after another. If I hit the button a 53rd time, not sure what would happen. Actually, I do know what would happen. It would blow up, all right, because I didn't put that check in there, all right? If I hit another game, it starts with an empty screen and goes and does that. All right, so let's look at the mechanics of what does this. Now, let's, let's talk about the next step. All right. We can almost by guess by looking at this guess at what's going on here. All right. We can almost guess what we have here. What layout XML files do I have? What layout XML files do I have? Okay. Linear and what does that do? But what is that for? Is that for the whole screen, you mean? The reason I'm asking is we actually have two linear layouts here. Okay, actually this, there are two linear layouts. There's a, and, and again, that's the reason I'm, I'm um, asking for. There is a linear layout that consists of the whole screen that consists of a button, another button, a scrollable, a scroll view, and inside the scroll view is a linear layout. I was debugging something and I was playing with the background colors, which is a good trick uh, from web de design. All right, If you want to see how big something is, make it a different color. So that's why, if you notice here, the Lighter green is the scrollable control, and a darker green is the linear layout. Okay. There's two linear layouts. There's a linear layout for the whole screen. Well, there's a linear layout for the whole screen, and then inside the scroll view, there's a linear layout. So I, I, I didn't 100% understand your question, but that's what it is. The dark green, the dark green is a linear layout. And it, and it expands, right. All right. The whole screen also, the white part is also a linear layout. All right. That's why I want to be clear of what we're doing. What else do we have in terms of XML for this? A card XML. So we have an XML for one card, all right? And what does that contain? What does our card XML contain? Pardon me? Not in the card XML. In the card class, we have two ints. But in the card XML, remember, that's the visual representation of a card. An image view. And that's it. So you're right when we talk about the card class. All right, the card class itself does, but this is a UI representation. Because remember, one of the things that we want to do in our code is um, we want to make it flexible so it's not, the, the UI and the functionality aren't tied too closely together. All right? For example, we could. It'd be a little dull, maybe, but we could write a blackjack game. Well, I'll, I'll give you a great example of what we could do this for. 
we could have a visually impaired mode where a screen reader would be reading, narrating the, uh, the, the code. In which case, showing an image wouldn't be good necessarily, but we could have text that said eight of diamonds so that the person would know uh, what it had. So through the use of some assistive technology, I'd assume there's screen readers available for Android. I guess, I, I don't know. But at any rate, um, that would be one possibility. So we might want to represent a card by two text labels instead of by an image. All right. Um, so therefore, we have the class that is the card, and we have the visual representation, which is, in this case, an image view, because we're showing an image view, but it could be something else. It could be text views. All right. Now let's look at our actual code. And sure enough, you'll see that is the case. Let's go into resources, layout. We have my activity main XML. And we have my card XML. The main XML, what does it consist of? It's a linear layout, right? If we look at it, we see that these things are stacked on top of each other. Button, button card area. So it's a linear layout. Sure enough, we have button, button, card area, which consists of a linear layout wrapped inside a scroll view. So we're going to add the cards, the image used for the cards, to this linear layout. And because it's wrapped in a scroll view, as it gets bigger, we'll be able to scroll through it. view. All right. The image view simply consists of a single image view. So I have my image view. I don't have a source for the image. Why not? Yeah, I'm going to set it via the program. In other words, I don't know what card I'm going to show. I'm going to show whatever card they drew. So I'm going to have my images out there, and the program is going to say, hey, you got a queen of hearts, so display the image for the queen of hearts. I do give it a size, though, so it knows how big it is. And that size matches the size of my card, 96 dp and by 71 dp. All right, let's look at the actual image files themselves. All right. I have, let's see, anything exciting in the drawable? No. Anything in the values? Not really. Just strings. Um, in the assets, I have these. Now, notice that there's a naming convention. All right? I have four folders that correspond to the suits. Clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. I have back PNG. What do you think the back PNG is ultimately going to be used for? The back of the card. So when the dealer is dealt a card, one of the cards, you don't see the face of the card, you see the back of the card. All right. Notice that there is a consistency in the naming scheme of these. All right. For 2 through 10, the file's name is 2 through 10. Ace, Jack, King, and Queen, 
is ace, jack, king, and queen. And it's like that for every suit. Why did I do it that way, do you suppose? Yeah, I made the programming cleaner. In other words, if the card can tell me what suit it is and what value it is, then we could get the image because the suit will tell us what folder to look in and the value of the card will tell us what image to use. Okay? So, this is a good approach to take where you use a convention, you know, um, doing things in a consistent manner. Other examples like that, you know, would be something like if you had part numbers, you know, let's say you were, you're selling products on, a, uh, on an app. Give each product number or part number the image for it give like the product number dot PNG. All right? By doing that consistently, then you don't have to worry about like, well, this product is called, you know, um, chair one dot PNG, and this desk is called 100 desk dot PNG or something like that. By, by doing some sort of consistent manner of doing it, you can, it can truly be data driven. In other words, you can generate the name of the file. You don't have to store the precise name of the file. You can generate the name of the file through other attributes. Okay. No questions about the UI then? We will move to my business logic classes. And my business logic classes, or probably better put, program, uh, problem domain classes, are the two classes that I talked about last time. The two that we would need for this. A debt class. and a card class. All right. Let's start out with the card class. As was stated, we have two integers plus a couple of other things. All right. The couple of other things we have are arrays to give us um, the name of the value. Because if we're storing an integer, you don't say that you drew the 13 of spades. You say you drew the ace of spades. Okay, or whatever the number is. So these exist to give us a name that corresponds to the number. So... In other words, in my scheme here, what this implies is zero for suit is hearts, one for suit is diamonds, two for suit is clubs, and three for suit is spades. And as far as the name of the card, zero is the two of heart, uh, two of whatever the suit is, three is the three, all the way up through, what would this be, nine? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 is the jack, 10 is the queen, 11 is the king, and 12 is the ace. All right? So again, this is just so that I, I, I can return something that's readable and understandable instead of these cryptic codes of 0 and 12, you know. That would be the ace of hearts, but who knows what that is. Or if, if I return the word ace of hearts, well, I can go look up the image and display it. Okay. So, what does this have? Well, what can a card do? All right. What does a card have and what can a card do? A card really has two attributes. Suit and the value or the name of the card. I'm using the word name of the card. Uh, value means something else when I think of blackjack. It means the number of points that it's worth. All right. So, I have those two attributes, and I set those two attributes via a constructor. This is a constructor. How can you tell that this is a constructor? Number one, it doesn't have a return value. It doesn't even have a return value of void. Right? Normally, if you don't return something, you say public void 
name of the function. But here we don't even say that. We just say public then something. What's another sign? Got the same name as the class. So in other words, you can create new card objects by doing this. Card C equals new card and that will create a card. What card will that create? That would be the ace of hearts because the first number indicates the suit. So the first argument I pass in indicates the suit. The second number indicates the um, name of the card. So 0 and 12 for these. 0 and 12 would be 0 is hearts, 12 is ace. Now notice that that's the only constructor I have. All right. So far in this class, we've created, so far in this course, when we've created classes, we haven't defined any constructors. All right. And what do constructors do? Well, they do two main things. They allocate the memory necessary for, for the object. And they can be used to initialize variables in that object. So far, the classes we've been using um, in the earlier examples didn't have any constructors, so all their constructors did were, were allocate the memory in the heap for that particular object. This constructor, though, we're allocating the memory and we are initializing those two variables to whatever arguments we pass in. So whatever suit we give and card we give, that's going to be the card that we get. All right? That's the only way to create a card. And if you think about it, it makes sense. There's no such thing as a card that doesn't have those attributes. All right? There's no such thing of a card that, I have a card here and it's the five, the five of what? Well, it doesn't have a suit. It doesn't make sense. Likewise, in a deck of playing cards, there's no blank cards, cards that have neither a value or a suit, and there's no cards that have a suit but no value. So to be a card, you have to have these two things. Oh, you're not a card. So therefore, when we create the card, we have to give it those two values. So that's the only constructor we have. All right? There's no defaults to say if we don't say otherwise, it's a heart or something like that. All right? When you create the card, you have to give it the suit and an integer, both represented by integers. Now, keep in mind this could be done a couple different ways, and I could add other methods in here, but the main thing I'm interested in to deal cards is I need the suit name and I need the card name that corresponds to the card. So I have two methods, one that says get suit and get name. The suit simply returns the name that, li that is in this array based on whatever value. So if I set the suit to 3, then it's going to return element 0, 1, 2, 3. It's going to return spades. If I set 5 for the kind of card, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it's going to return to 7. So it would be the 7 of spades. Yes? For the array? Well, okay, question is, is why is this a string? All right. Well, first of all, we are storing a number, right? We're storing a, we're storing a suit, all right? And we're storing a numeric value of the suit. All right, my get, the reason I have a get is that if my goal is to deal cards, I need the string for the name and the string for the suit. Yeah, if, uh, to, to, to form the name of the image. Now, will I need 
Well, I need the points somewhere. Yes, somewhere down the line I'm going to need the points. So, I could add additional methods in if I needed the points when I go to, to degrade that. But one thing to keep in mind, that's not really an attribute of a card, right? That's an attribute of the rules of the game. Because in Rummy, for example, cards have different point values. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's really all there is in the card class, which kind of makes sense, right? There's not much a card can do, all right? Card can, you need to create a card, and you need to say what suit and value it is, and you need to be able to say what the suit is and what the value is. Now we might, again, to your point, and that's a good point, maybe down the line we'll have a get suit value that returns an integer or something like that. All right, but for now, just for dealing, we're okay with this. Again, the point I do want to raise, though, is that's not a method in the card class. That's a method in the rules class because different card games have different rules for what points things are worth. In poker, for example, cards don't really have points associated with them. All right, individual cards don't really have points associated with them. All right. On to the debt class, which is more substantial. All right, what is a deck? And again, think about this, you know. I go and grab a deck. I'm putting my 250 to good use here by pulling out my deck of cards again. What is a deck? What does a deck consist of? A deck simply consists of a bunch of cards. That's it. A bunch of cards. So, my class represents that by saying what attributes are associated with a card. Well, uh, I'm sorry, what attributes are associated with the deck? What's associated with the deck is a collection of cards. Each one of those cards has its own two attributes, name and value. Nine of, nine of diamonds. All right, so each card has two attributes, a name and a value. So, for us to have a deck, all right, we're assuming we're starting with a fresh deck, all right? Start with a fresh deck. So, in the real world, starting with a fresh deck would involve, you know, taking the box, opening it up, and the cards are going to be in a certain order in there, right? So in a way, we're going to simulate that too, all right? So I have one constructor on the deck. Again, this is a constructor, all right? How do I know it's a constructor? It doesn't show a return value. It doesn't even say that the return value is void. It simply says public deck. That indicates it's a constructor. And the other thing that indicates it's a constructor is that the that the thing that looks like a method, the constructor's name matches the name of the class. Okay, so when I create a new deck, I want to start with a fresh deck. All right? So I have a method that says initialize deck. All right? I could put this code up here, but I may, I may have had it there, and that at some point I said, you know what, I actually want to start with a fresh deck at two different points. One is when I start the game, one is after I deal a couple cards and I want to refresh. So, I took that code that I want to call under two circumstances, when I create a fresh deck, 
And when I say, all right, I want to start over, and I put that in a method called initialize DAC. I see a little bug in here, but we'll leave it go for now. All right. What does initialize deck do? Effectively, it creates each of the 52 cards. How does it create each of the 52 cards? Well, it creates each of the four suits. All right. How does it create each of the four suit? Well, for each suit, it creates 0 through 12. That is the 2 through the ace. So, we knew that that's the instructor we use to create a new card. All right. We know that because that's a constructor on the card. The card class has a constructor where we give it a suit and a integer that corresponds to the name of the card, and that's what we do to create it. What we're simply doing here is we're having nested for loops. Okay? How do nested for loops work? We have an outer loop and an inner loop. For every one iteration of the outer loop, this loop executes 13 times. So, this instruction here, these instructions here. First time through the loop, i is going to have a value of 0, j is going to have a value of 0. i is then going to have a value of 0, j is going to have a value of 1. 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, all the way up through 0, 12. We have then completed the first iteration of the loop. Because we start i with 0, we do this inner loop 13 times, j having a, starting with a value of 0, doing it as long as j is less than 13, and each time through the loop we're creating a new card that has a value of i for the suit and a value of j for the card. So we're creating a card for hearts because 0 is the number that corresponds to hearts. And then we're creating the 2 of hearts, 3 of hearts, 4 of hearts, all the way up through ace of hearts. We then go and do this outer loop again. This time, i is going to have a value of 1. So, we're going to be creating the diamonds. That inner loop then does its thing again, and runs from, z from 0 all the way through 12. So after the second trip through the loop, we've created the hearts and the diamonds. Third trip through the loop, we're creating the clubs. I is going to have a value of 2. So we're creating the clubs. Index has a value of 2. The inner loop runs from 0 through 12. Finally, last but not least, we create spades. I has a value of 3. We go J3 through 12, and we've created the 52 cards. Four suits, 13 cards per suit, 52 cards. We've literally created those card objects, because when you make a deck at the Aviator Card Company, when they make a deck, they make a deck by making 52 cards, <laughs> all right, and putting them all together. So that's what effectively what we do. We make 52 cards and put them together. All right. Then 
We had talked about this shuffling the deck, right? It certainly would be a boring blackjack game if you knew the cards were in the order two of hearts, three of hearts, four of hearts, and so on. So we want to shuffle the deck. Fortunately, there is a method for that. All right? And that is collections.shuffle cards. That's not something I wrote. That's simply an available method that you can take any collection, any ancestor of collection, and shuffle it. So randomly rearrange the cards in that array list. Collection is a, is a predefined class in the Java framework. It's a Java utility. An array list is a kind of collection, and there's other things that are kinds of collections. And you can shuffle them, which means you can rearrange them randomly. Yes? Yes. Initialized deck made to be used just by this class? Yeah. It could be private. Yep. In fact, that wouldn't be a bad idea because the outside world would want to do these two things. Would want to call the constructor and would want to call refresh the deck. I have a simple rule here. Actually, there's not a bug in here. I was, I was mistaken. Although I could, well, never mind. We won't go there. Uh, I could improve this a little bit by moving this line in there. Refresh deck, what they do is they don't wait until they're all done with the deck to start with a new deck. In other words, as you're dealing blackjack, you deal the first card, second card, third card, and they gather the cards up. Then they play with the rest of the deck, all right, the next hand. So when you get down to just a handful of cards left, they start with a new deck again. Okay. In real casinos, yes, there is. In my casino, there's one deck. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, to switch decks or whatever. You could create several deck objects and, 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 and do that. Well, well, what you would have is you would have if, if you wanted to do that, whether you had five decks or six decks, you would actually, in your application, make six deck objects. And then each deck object would have its own array of cards. Yep. So we do have a, a, a refresh that says, okay, we're almost at the end of the deck. Let's start with a new deck. And that calls that. Now, we have... Another method on here, which is get next card, or you, we could call this the deal method, if you wanted. All right. And what is it? It's a public method. It returns what? When I deal a card, what do you get? You get a card. All right. So, again, I'm pointing this out, and maybe it's obvious, but I, I, I think sometimes developers like, forget their real world hat when they start programming. And keep in mind that when you write code like this, you're writing code that models some real life activity. You know, If you are writing like the pizza example, you're getting the price of the order, you're modeling the thought process that would go on in a cash register or in the pizza clerk's brain of adding up all the pizzas to come up with how much it is and looking to see what, how much time it will take to bake it. All right? Whereas in dealing, when I ask for the next card, what do I get? I get a card. So therefore, I return a card object. Now, some people might think, and again, not you necessarily, well, I would get a suit and a value. Well, no, you get a card. Now, the card itself has a suit and a value, but we don't have to get those things separately. We already have. We've encapsulated that behavior in one place. So we get a card. And anything we can do with a card, we can now do with when we deal the card. Now, first instruction says, so we're returning a card. Card next equals cards get zero. What is that? Well, remember, cards is our array list. Get is a method to return the object in a certain position. And in this case, I'm returning zero. Could I return what would give me the last card in the deck? 
assuming I started with a new deck? 51. Why didn't I use 51 there? My deck keeps getting smaller. The second time through, the last card is 50. So I, there's always going to be, until I run out of cards, there's always going to be a top card, a zeroth card. Yes? Not next dot size, cards dot size. Yeah, because cards is the array list. Next is the one card. So, what am I doing? I am getting the next card. So, what this says is look at the first object in my array list. So, it's the first card in my array list. In other words, the top card. All right? Grab it. I grabbed it. Get rid of it from the deck. Remove it. Return it. Give it to whoever asked for it. All right. So quite literally, we're doing exactly that in code. We have our stack of cards. This is card zero. We grab it, remove it from the deck, and give it to whoever asked for it. All right. So this function returns a card. It uses a couple of standard array list functions. That is get with an index to get the first card or card sub zero. And then finally, we remove whatever card we got, we remove from the deck. Because we don't want two ace of spades or something like that. We want, once, once we deal a card, it's gone. It's off of the deck. Yes? Okay. Okay, in other words, you're saying you shuffle the decks. You don't shuffle the cards from deck one with the cards of deck two. Yeah, it'd be like I have six decks, and then I can shuffle the decks, and then I can order what the decks. Sequence the decks, right. Okay, what you'd do is you would, uh, you would ob what you'd have is you'd have a collection or an array list of decks that lived in some other class. So a deck is a deck. All right, it represents a single deck. If you have a collection of decks, you would have another object for that. And I don't know if there's like a, a word, what they would call that, like where you hold the decks in a casino. Is there a name for it? The shoot? Yeah. So you would have a shoot class then. And the shoot class would have an array list of six decks or whatever. When you created the shoot class, <laughs> you would create the six decks add them to the list of that, you would add, by virtue of creating the deck class, all right, you would um, create each deck, each deck then would create the cards, would shuffle them, and then you'd have a routine to shuffle the decks in the shoot class, okay? A Gotcha. Gotcha. Then, then there would be, what there would be is there'd be a next card method on the shoot. Okay? And you wouldn't ask for the next card. You would ask the shoot for the next card. And what would the shoot do? The shoot would decide what deck to use and then call that deck's next card method. All right? Right, randomly pick a deck and then say, give me deal from that deck. So essentially what we would be doing is we'd like just be bumping everything up a level. All right, there would be, right now we have cards. A collection of cards is a deck. We'd make a collection of decks called a shoot and we'd add an extra step in the dealing. First you deal from the shoot. Dealing from the shoot would involve selecting the deck, 
dealing from the deck, and then you'd, in, the, when the day is done, you'd still end up with a card. I'm not understanding you 100%. In other words, what you're saying is all those decks get shuffled together. Exactly. You're not shuffling the deck, you're shuffling all the cards of that. Right. Um, yeah, what you, you, could, you could still do that, all right. Um, what, yeah, you, you would have then... Have a, right. Right. Okay. Yeah. You. You could. Yeah. Something like that. That's. That's a little more detailed than than we need to do for for our example. Um, the one thing I would say though is I would still maintain the integrity of the deck class because decks are used in other card games. So I wouldn't get rid of the deck class and create just a shoe class or whatever. I would have the shoe class use the deck class to, to, to get the cards. Yes? All right. Other questions? Uh, I always get over my head in this class because I always have like one or two like gamblers in here. Uh, the first semester I did this, I had someone that really like, well, what about splitting? Well, what about if you want to put insurance? And, yeah, and it's like, I don't know. We're just playing a simple blackjack game, you know. It, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like in his case, I wanted to say, okay, then you want to make that a requirement of the assignment? Fine, well, you know, but, but no, I won't, I won't do that. And it is good to discuss. It is good to discuss. But again, you know, we, we don't really need to take it uh, that far in this. Yeah. Right, right. Right. So I, I probably, uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, again, the nice thing is, is, if, is, okay, maybe we call that attribute something else, but you could then, if you store those three numbers, you could combine them whatever you wanted. You could combine the two-point and three-point shots to get a percentage and, and so on. All right. So now let's look. Is there any questions about this? Let, let's summarize. We have a very small and boring card class. Because cards don't do much, right? That would make sense. Cards simply have a value and a suit. And it, a card can tell you its value and suit. That's all a card essentially can do. And a card has to have a value and suit. Therefore, we can't even make a card object without setting the value and suit. Now, how do we make sure we don't create two of the same card? That's the deck's job, all right? It's the deck's job to make sure there's not two ace of spades in here, all right? And that's why we have code in here that initializes it. So 
card, we have to create it giving it a suit and name. Those suit and names, we can get the text version or the string version of the suit and name by looking at here. And that's about it for, for that. For the card, or I'm sorry, for the deck class, we can initialize it. Initializing it consists of running through the loop to create the 52 cards. So if your job was to make a deck, your job would be to create 52 cards. So how do we do that? By calling the constructor 52 times. And again, the, the straightforward way to do that, or the, the, the most efficient way to do that, is to create each suit with an outer loop, create each value of the card with the inner loop. Uh, and then when we're done, we use that built-in method to shuffle. All right? Yeah, that was, that was my bug. I probably should take this and put it up here. That gets rid of any cards that happen to be left over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, remember way back when I said there was a bug in here, then I said no, there wasn't. The reason that there wasn't a bug is I had it down there. It would make sense to have it there instead. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, negligible. In other words, to have 52 separate statements that say, I would say that um, the difference would be negligible. Um, and uh, any, the, the 52 in separate initializations would probably be quicker, a teensiest bit quicker, but it's not worth it for the programming difficulty of copying and pasting 52 times and ended up getting six aces of hearts because you forgot to change the index in one of them. All right? That's not worth... Uh, Dealing that and, and having a brawl at your casino and, you know, and, and that sort of thing. But again, the difference would have to be negligible. The only reason I'm thinking it would be a little bit longer is because um, you're going to do these statements 52 times. If I hard-coded them, I would also be doing them 52 times. But... I would, uh, I, I have the little teensy bit of overhead on the loop. All right. All right, now let's look at how this works together. We have the UI. We have the uh, business logic. Let's see what we want to do. In a nutshell, if I can describe this, we start with a blank screen. We have our deck that contains the 52 cards. Every time I press hit, what do I do? I ask the deck for the next card. I figure out what the image is associated with that next card. I inflate my layout, all right, my card layout. I, what, what's next? I set the attributes of that card layout to the proper image, all right. And then finally, I add that card to my dark green area, which represents what I'm dealing out. Yes, but, but keep in mind, remember, you folks have to have so much fun too. So I took it this far. It's your job to think about what you need to do next. And we'll spend some, min some minutes at the end of class talking about like what would you need to do next. But you're absolutely right. All right, you need to think through and how to do that, but my part of the bargain was just showing you how to deal cards, boom, 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 onto a table, all right? You, get, you, have, the, you have the joy of actually writing the blackjack game. All right, so there we go. Let's go and look at our activity. And here's the nice thing about this. One thing that's cool about programming is if I understand how the deck and card class works, or maybe even if someone else wrote that class, all right, and I'm just using it, I don't have to worry about the details of what goes on in that class. I can sort of put that out of my mind, all right? I know that if I call the deck's 
call it, get next card, I'm getting a card. And as long as the deck, you know, as long as whoever created that deck object did their job right, I know I'm getting the next card on the deck. I don't have to worry about what that does. I don't have to worry about array lists. I don't have to worry about getting, removing, shuffling. I don't have to worry about anything. That's the whole notion of encapsulation. All right? And modularization. There's a component that's responsible for maintaining a deck of cards. All right? And all anyone that's using that, in this case, this game, but there could be other games that use it, right? We could make a whole suite of card applications. All we have to do is call the right method on the deck, we get a card, we have a winner. All right. So I got all these imports here. Here's my activity. I have three, I'm sorry, four instance variables. All right. I have a deck, because associated with this game is a deck. Associated with this activity, rather, it's a deck. I have a linear layout for the player's hand, that is this green area. All right, that's the player's hand. And then I have my two buttons. I'm making those attributes. I'm going to get pointers to those so I can use those throughout my activity. So I go and do my thing like I've done since day one. I grab a pointer to this area. I grab a pointer to the reset button, I grab a pointer to the hit button, and I set button listeners for those. New reset button handler. And then I have my button handler. This is an example of an inner class that is not anonymous, although this class has a name, reset button handler. Then I call initialize game. What does initialize game do? It creates a new deck and it clears the layout. Okay? So I create the new deck and I clear my layout. So when I open this up, I now have a deck object that has all 52 cards in it in a shuffled order. And I have an empty player hand area. Notice my event handlers. Not a lot of code there, right? That's good. All right, we don't want our event handlers to have a lot of code. So in this case, if I click the reset button, I call initialize game again. Just like I did when the game started and I wipe the slate clean, start with a new deck, start with an empty area. So I call the same method that I called when I created the game, initialize game, to just wipe everything out, start clean. The more interesting one is give player a card. So when the hit button is clicked, give player a card. And that starts the ball in motion. So, what do I do? Well, first thing I do is I grab the next card. D is my deck, so I'm, I grab the card from the deck. All right? And again, this is a great thing of modularization and encapsulation and object oriented. I don't have to know anything about how the deck does its thing. I just create the deck and ask for the next card, and I'm good to go. All right. I then do my inflating thing. I create my inflator. I inflate, and I make a new image view that I'm going to put the card for that card. So I have two things, right, that I could both call the card. I have the card itself the card object itself, and I have the image view that corresponds to that. Again, the UI part of it and the logic part of it. So, I inflate my 
layout, cast it to an image view, and right here, my image view is called new card. All right. I can do that because that's the only view in here. I don't have to do what I just cut. Where I do new card, find view by ID. All right. That image view is the only thing in that in the view that gets created. So it's not like the Twitter example where I had um, a new row, new table row that had like three fields in it or something like that. So I don't really need this here. What I inflated, that's the new image view. That's the new card image view. I then go and do some code here that In a nutshell, what it's going to do is it's going to go and find the image and load the image in that new card image. Yeah, this is actually something, unfortunately, I cut from another example. And therefore, it's not a flag. So it should be card. We define D as a deck object. And when we initialize the game, we create our new deck. So when I say D.getNextCard, I'm calling the getNextCard method on the deck object for this activity. Now C is the card. C is the card that we got when we dealt. Remember that get next card returns a card. So I'm storing a pointer of that card in my variable called C. Now here's something I might change if I was doing this. I'm actually opening the stream and I'm asking the card for its suit and its name. I could change this to have, the, to have a method on the card that returned the full image name. So I wouldn't have to do this little bit of manipulation. I could just say c.getImageName. That would probably be an improvement uh, here. But eh, we could argue it either way. There's reasons to do it this way as well. So I don't know. The bottom line is when I am done, I go and I grab and I create an image, a drawable, and I set the image views drawable to the image that I pull from this file. And what is that file again? That file is the suit, a slash, and the name of the card. So, and it's from assets. So, from my assets, I pull... Suit slash name of the card. I then go and I add that new card to my hand layout, player hand layout, which is that linear layout, the green one. And I add it at the end. Get child count. So if it already has one, I add it at position two. Well, what do you think we would do? What, 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 what do you want to try here? Let's, let's give it a shot. If I wanted to put the new card at the top of the list, what do you suppose I would put instead of the number of children? Zero. Let's try that. Let me go here and change this to zero.
All right, hit, hit, and now it adds it at the top. I could ask you that same question. <laughs> How would we make it go across the screen? That's a layout issue, right? Again, this is where this is where Well, that's a darn good question. Let's find that out. I think it's going to go off the screen. Yeah. Uh, let's go and let, let's set this guy to horizontal. I might not have my properties on my scrollable object correct, so I should be able to go and scroll that way. Yeah. Right. Now, how could I, well, through positioning, I could possibly make it so they overlapped if I wanted to get clever about it. That would give me room for more cards. Pardon me? And that would be cool. That would look more like an actual blackjack hand than anyhow. So, yeah, that's a problem. But again, this, this is going to be my catchphrase for this class. You guys have to have some of the fun too. All right? So I can help you figuring out how to, how to handle that. But um, in a nutshell, yep, that's it. Now, um, let's see. Was there anything else? Do you have, does anyone have any questions about this? Oh, I know one thing I want to talk about. Create my service to do the inflation. I am inflating my layout. I do this. This is something that I, I had to play with a little bit. And I think this is, uh, I was getting real tiny cards for the longest time. All right, and this is code that I know worked on an earlier version of Android. So I put that in. When you're doing things like match parent and things like that, you ha uh, it, it helps the layout inflator know where this is going to end up. So this is going. This card is going to end up as part of p hand layout. All right, which is my variable up there that points to that green area where the player's hand is. And I don't want to immediately add it to there. I want to manually add it after I've set some attributes to it. All right? So what this does is this inflates or creates the living, breathing objects from that layout. We're telling it that eventually we're going to put it in there so it knows some sizing information that is useful. But we're not in there yet. So that's what the false means. It would pop it in there, yeah. And the worst that would happen is you might see a flash of a blank image and then, I, again, I, I wouldn't want to put that in there until I was done initializing it. Probably wouldn't cause any harm. I mean, you could try it, I guess, but, um, you know, you could also try that if you want. Now, the new view that we created, we know is an image view. How do we know it's an image view? Because we made this our layout card. And that our layout card is an image view. The compiler doesn't know it's an image view, though, because the compiler simply knows that inflating makes a view or views. All right? Now, we know that that's an image view, then. All we're doing here is we're saying, well, we want to treat that view that's created. We know it's an image view. We want to treat it like an image view. So we cast it to image view. And now we have a pointer to that new view that we created that's floating in space somewhere. It's not on the, the screen yet. All right? 
And now we can do things with it. And that involves using the asset manager to grab in and creating a drawable from that image file that we have. All right. And then setting the image of our card to that new drawable. Finally, when we're done, we actually go and add that card to the player's hand. And that's what that does. Get child count is asking how many things are in P hand layout now. So initially there's zero. After we add one, there's one thing in it. So we add it in position one. So that way we're adding, we're always adding to the end of the list. That was the question that was said, how could we add it to the beginning of the list again? Well, we'd put zero in there, so we'd always add it in position zero. Now, we have a try-catch here. Um, we, I do not believe, I could be wrong, but I do not believe we've seen a try-catch elsewhere in this course so far. What's a try-catch for? Error catching in case something goes wrong. Did we just simply not care if anything went wrong before? <laughs> Pardon me? Partly a learning exercise. But there's a specific reason why a try catch is beneficial here. Okay, and that's very true, that, that putting a try-catch in, we can do some error catching and all that. I guess what I'm asking is, what is so special about this code that we wanted to put a try-catch? Okay, that's the catch. I guess what I'm saying is, what's so special about the try part of it? Why are we catching exceptions on that And why does this need to be tested? Actually, that would probably be this one up here. Exactly. Because this is relying on an external file. This is relying on something outside of my code. All right? For this to work, these assets have to be here. And if one of those assets are gone, it's blowing up. That's outside of my control. Right? I mean, if it's gone, it's gone, and I can't do anything with it. Exactly. Good way to put it. Um, so, one, one second. So, anything that sort of goes outside of your code, for example, like a database interactivity. If it, later on we're going to do some very simple database operations. Well, that requires using some database classes and all that. Well, that's outside of our control. What if there was an issue with that? Well, if it's outside of our control, we're going to put a try-catch. Yes? Um, so you get the in-play, you get the uh, linear. So you really want to be free by having that. Exactly. And that's what I want to take at least a couple minutes doing here, is how to, make, how to turn this into a real blackjack game. Well, first of all, initialized game is going to be different, right? Oh, well, well, let's back up. You're absolutely right. We're going to have not one linear layout for cards. We're going to have two linear layout for cards. Does it have to be linear layout? Absolutely not. You could do it with table rows if you wanted. All right. Um, you could, you know, you can do it however you want. Linear layout or table rows are probably your two choices. All right. So you're going to have two of them: one for the player, one for the dealer. All right. And we're going to alternate, and there needs to be a way to add to the players, add to the dealers, all right, depending on what is being done. When you deal, you alternate, when you initialize the game. The initialization of the game has to be handled. All right, that you don't just deal a bunch of cards out, you deal one to the dealer, or, or I'm sorry, one to the player, one to the dealer, second to the player, second to the dealer, all right? So that 
part of the initialization process when you play a new game. You should do that. Um, you then need something to, how do I want to say this? To implement the rules of blackjack. That is, players shouldn't be able to hit, hit the hit button over and over and over again. At some point, if they bust, they bust. All right? So there needs to be some rules, a rule class, that's going to look at the, the player's hand and say, hey, you just lost. All right? Or, yeah, you're still good. All right? There's going to need to be the stay button. All right? I don't have a stay button on here. There'll need to be a stay button that when you press it, it disables the hit button, can't take any more hits after you've stayed, and then the dealer does their thing, all right, and does the hits up to 17 or higher. Rule, same rule object going I have to tell me if the dealer hit, uh, if the dealer uh, bust or not, all right. And lastly, assuming that none of them busted, there's going to be uh, uh, something in the rules class to tell me who won. It's going to look at the hands, evaluate them, and tell me this person won, that person won. Dealer won, player won. Okay? So what I want you to do, and this is part of the first week's assignment, is to sort of think about designing that. Think about what classes you're going to need to achieve this. All right? And then I put out the next assignment uh, already. The next assignment, in a nutshell, is simply extend this to look like it's playing blackjack, but not really. All right? You don't have to score the game. You just have to be able to press hit, 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 and, you know, and then stay if you want. And it doesn't really have to do the scoring or anything. The scoring and all that will be the next week's assignment. Yes? That would be that would be in the rules. That would be in the rules uh, class. Yep, all the you know all the, those things um, would be in the rules class. The uh, evaluating the cards would have to be smart enough to know if they have an ace, count it as eleven. But if they're busted, count it as a one. All right, and we can talk about details of this again. I, I'm, I'm not like sticking you out to dry. I want to do this sort of like um, in a workshop mode where, where we talk about these things and we um, discuss them and all that. But the first step is to think about the design and to discuss that. Yes? Already there. All right. It is already there. Pardon me? Right. And also already there are three of the Deedle examples, the three that we went over in class. I tried to upload all of them, but the upload was like sitting there taking forever and maybe it exceeded some limit on Canvas's end or something like that. So I just zipped up, I, I put the three examples that we've gone over in class and zipped them up and, and put them up there. You'll find this and the Deedle examples in the um, week six module. Other questions? All right, have a great weekend. More Blackjack on Tuesday.